Tonight, our conversation with a truly fascinating individual, the CEO of the San Francisco AIDS Foundation, but also the author of a book, The Campaign Within. Tonight, our conversation with Neil Giuliano, former mayor of Tempe, Arizona, former Republican, and now a leader in the fight against AIDS. Neil, welcome. Thank you, David. Good to be here. So let's start with your current job, CEO sure. of the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. You know, when I moved to San Francisco in 1986, it was a very mm. different epidemic. Yes. How has AIDS changed, and how is it not only keeping funding alive, but frankly keeping the attention of people who think this epidemic is over? Right. Well, and most importantly, it's keeping people alive. The tremendous advances on the medical side, the antiretroviral treatments, the early mm -hmm. cocktails, now to the point where folks can take one pill a day to keep their virus under control and keep them what we would call undetectable if they're in treatment long mm -hmm. enough really has transformed the epidemic. But we have to remember in San Francisco with a population of about 16,000 HIV positive people, we have roughly one new infection a day in San Francisco. Wow. But with the one new infection a day, 80% of those are still gay and bisexual men in San Francisco. That's what's unique about San Francisco because elsewhere in the United States and certainly globally, the pandemic is far beyond just gay and bi men. Right. It's in, in, in of course, in the continent of Africa, it's mainly a heterosexual Correct. disease. Right. Does it ever frustrate you when you think, you know, God, didn't gay men get the memo about how this was spread back in 1981, 2, 3, mm -hmm. 4, 5, and 6? Well, they have received the memo, and, and there mm -hmm. has been tremendous advancements. When you think about it, just, just a few years ago, in 2009, there were over 1,000 new infections a year in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And here we are in 2013 with less than one a day. Right. So we're making great progress, but we have to keep on the bandwagon with, re with prevention methods. Mm -hmm. We have to be talking about uh, people's health overall, which is what we're doing at San Francisco AIDS Foundation, is mm -hmm. talking about HIV in the full reign of holistic health and wellness. Because we have people living with HIV in San Francisco. We want to ensure people don't contract the virus. So it's complex, but we're having great success in San Francisco, I'm very proud to say. Right. Now, what about the fundraising effort? I mean, the recession has sure. hit everything, it's really nonprofits. But I know from speaking with friends and colleagues who work, for instance, in uh, breast cancer nonprofits mm -hmm. and other things, they feel that they have learned from the model yes. of AIDS, HIV, nonprofit fundraising in the 80s and 90s. They have. Now, are we kind of the poor stepkid? Not the poor stepkids so much, but uh, we certainly have to evolve as well. Uh, fundraising for HIV AIDS has always been very event focused, and we're very successful with events. We have the AIDS life cycle, mm -hmm. we're going to raise a lot of money with that, but we have to pivot and we have to get into the full philanthropic world mm -hmm. and have people who are supporting our health and wellness programming, our prevention work, our treatment work, our care work, the sexual health clinic in the Castro. All of that needs support, not just from people getting together for a walk or a run or a ride, but just in terms of overall philanthropy. So mm -hmm. we're still making that transition. It's an important transition for us to make. Talk to me a little bit about how the AIDS, HIV pandemic is different geographically. I mean, here in San Francisco, it's not only the, the epicenter, kind of psychologically in many sure. ways, but is it different in San Francisco being, let's talk about the gay male mm -hmm. population, a gay man with AIDS than it is in Sacramento or Fresno or, well, or Tempe, Arizona? It, it is different in the sense that, um, as I said, we have a high preponderance of, of our newly infected people in San Francisco are gay and bi men. That's the case nationally. So roughly 50,000 new cases of HIV, diagnosis mm -hmm. of HIV, a year in the United States still. Now, that's been, that number's been flat for about 10 years. There have been 50,000 a year. But when you think about that 50,000 number and less than 400 of those are San Francisco, it shows the progress that we're making with the programs and the work that we have in the San Francisco model of care, which has been replicated around the world. Right. The challenge is, in many other communities, their prevention work and their conversations about sexual health are not as productive as ours, and so the prevention and not is... As, and not as forthright. And not as forthright, <laughs> not as direct, so they're having a more difficult time uh, curbing the rate of infection into other populations. For example, in the South. In the South, people of color are disproportionately hit with HIV. Same thing in cities like Washington, D.C. or New York City. So our work is a little bit different, but yet we're all dealing with the same virus. Right. And the hope is that as more people get into treatment, we test people, we find out who doesn't know their status, get them into treatment, lower their viral load, lower the, lower the community viral load, and we will get to the day when a new HIV infection in San Francisco is incredibly rare. And that's what we're on the path toward in San Francisco. Right. Which is uh, exciting. Do you, uh, have you done the AIDS life cycle? 
I've done it three times now. So you, so you, three years as CEO of the. Yes. Uh, I've done the ride each year. Yeah, I did the second one 18 years ago. My husband did it last oh. year. We're doing it uh, next year. Probably That's hitting great. up our viewers to fundraise. I hope you will. Thank you. In uh, three years of this job, you know, biking, mm -hmm. but also probably walking the walk. Sure. How many slings and arrows have you had to? Well, I think any time you're in uh, a role that's going to be a very public role, a yeah. very visible role, and you're interfacing with the community, that, that comes with the territory. And uh, San Francisco AIDS Foundation is, has a very tremendous and loyal following of supporters and people and clients who use our services, over 15,000 clinical visits a year to our clinic in the Castro. So we have a lot of support built up within the community, and, and that certainly helps a lot. It makes us feel good. Right. I want to talk to you a little bit now about your book, mm -hmm. um, The Campaign Within, A Mayor's Private Journey to Public Leadership. Yes. So when did you come out of the closet? When did you know you were a gay man? Well, I knew I was gay probably in middle school, but uh, I was in a Roman Catholic, Italian-American strict household, and of course, uh, I, I came across, the, the remember that book, Everything You Always Wanted to Know, know About, about Sex? Know About Sex, Afraid to Ask. Yes, yeah. well, I, I actually found that book took a copy of it from, uh, it's a, that's a longer story that's in the book, but then read the part about what is homosexuality, and quite honestly, it scared me. Mm -hmm. It said I was sick, I was disordered, I could change if I really wanted to and went to a psychotherapist for many years, and uh, that certainly didn't help. So I, as I acknowledge to myself more and more that this is not a phase, this is the way it is, that look in the mirror that I call it, that I think we probably mm -hmm. all have at one point, uh, that look in the mirror was when I was a sophomore in college, uh, but still stayed in the closet and didn't do very much about it until much later in life. I publicly came out mm -hmm. after I had been elected mayor of the city of Tempe mm -hmm. when I was 36 years old. Right. Um, I, too, went to a Catholic school, uh, not Italian, but run by Benedictine nuns mm -hmm. and monks. You know, besides running to a psychotherapist as an option, you know, I thought, well, I have to run to my priest. I mean, what sure. did you think about this as a good Catholic boy in Arizona? I thought for sure that, um, that I was what I had heard everyone around me saying. You're sick, you're disordered, something is wrong here. It's not something you certainly don't talk about. Um, and certainly not in my family. It was, you know, sex in general was never talked about. So, yeah. um, you know, I had my struggles. That's why it's a journey. I think yeah. it's a journey for a lot of us, but have come out on the other side pretty well, I think, and have really enjoyed the roles that I've had with the LGBT community. Yeah. Now, you took a little bit of heat when you came out after being elected. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, um, it was not a big, big secret. In, in fact, the lead paragraph in the newspaper article when I finally did come out publicly was ending years of rumor and speculation. <laughs> so it was not a big, big secret. But, uh, you know, the first time I ran, I was still a registered Republican in mm -hmm. a Republican town. I actually uh, ran against and beat another Republican. These are nonpartisan elections, but registered Republican. Um, people knew, but it was not talked about. And so when I finally was willing to talk about it after uh, a couple of the right-wing folks in town, religious right folks in town, sort of played their card, and I said, you know what, this is, we're not going to live this way. Um, aside from uh, a small demographic of people whose minds I will never change, everyone was very supportive, and it was really a great relief to be able to go over that line and realize the world was not going to end. In fact, people would be supportive and understanding, and I was the same person, and the people around me uh, enabled me to be the leader that I've been able to become. Right. You know, people talk nowadays of Reagan Republicans and yeah. Rockefeller Republicans. You were very much a John McCain. Republican. Uh, yes, and John and, and Cindy are friends of mine, and uh -huh. I've known John since I was in college and stu student body president at Arizona State University, which was the year he first ran for Congress right. in Arizona. So what's your relationship with him and now, and Cindy? Because they, oh, friendly, they're on different sides uh, of the uh, same-sex marriage debate. On, on LGBT issues, they're on different sides. Um, but I will tell you, um, as, for, as people, uh, great people and very supportive people, and they've been very good friends for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. So we agree not to talk about politics, uh, perhaps sometimes, if we're together, we won't touch on those issues. <laughs> um, but so you, you still know, have a relationship with him? Yes. In fact, we, uh, we just had Cindy cast in the showing of Eight, the play. We did, I, I executive produced a, the Eight play with mm -hmm. Dustin Lance Black. Cleve Jones came down, was in mm -hmm. it. Cindy was supposed to be cast in it as well, but she ended up being in the hospital during the time we ran yeah. the show, so she couldn't do it. So, yes, yeah, still in touch with them and, and maintain good contacts with a lot of my friends and supporters in Arizona. So you told us when you came out as a, Democrat, uh, a gay man. Right. 
Well, that, that leads to my next question. Yeah. When did you discover you were a Republican, and then what was that tipping point that you yeah. said, I'm done? Well, I was raised with a Republican family. My dad was a Republican city councilman in northern New Jersey, where we first grew up, um, but very much a moderate, sort of more probably the Rockefeller Republicans mm -hmm. of the north and Northeast. Um, I stayed a Republican. I voted for Gerald Ford. That was the first election I voted in for Gerald Ford for president. And then, uh, and stayed sort of in that moderate wing. When I started to see the Republican Party going further and further right, being controlled further and further by uh, religious doctrine and the religious right of the party having such a stranglehold, uh, and at this point I was out and I was openly gay, I knew I was going to have very limited influence on the party. Mm -hmm. And I still wanted to have influence and wanted to play a role. So I actually switched parties um, the night that Barack Obama was uh, elected president mm -hmm. and sent in the registration card to change my registration the very next morning because I had made a commitment to my friend John McCain that I would stick with him through the campaign mm -hmm. and I would uh, stay in the party for his final run yeah. for the president. I had co-chaired the mayors for McCain back in 2000 with Susan Golding from, New from San Diego mm -hmm. when he first ran and lost to George Bush. Yeah, well, and of course we know that one of the greatest commodities in politics is, is loyalty. Loyalty and friendship and, you know, I have some very, uh, very, very strong beliefs about um, LGBT issues and these mm -hmm. kinds of policies. Um, but yet I have a very, very wide array of friends. My right. friends on Facebook get into fights all the time, and I just sort of stay out of them. Yeah, yeah. My brother is a founder of the Tea Party movement in Texas, so I just try to leave that relationship yeah. to my, you know, it's, my husband to manage. It's not <laughs> unlike uh, how our issues are being talked about in a lot of families. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, the, the, the whole country is having the conversation. The whole country is moving forward. Culturally, we've seen tremendous advancement in a very short period of time. Some people need to catch up a bit. We'd like them to catch up faster. But the reality is we're going to get there. Right. We're going to have full equality. In uh, our last few minutes, talk to me about what writing this book meant to you. Why did you write it, and are you running for public office again? Well, <laughs> I wrote it uh, because, if you think about it, not many openly gay elected officials have told their story mm -hmm. because many of them do want to run for office again. So maybe mm -hmm. they don't want to be as forthcoming, perhaps, as they might with, with you have to be if, if you're going to write a memoir. You have to disclose and you have to talk about your journey. Um, if I'm ever going to run again, I have no idea. It's not on my radar right now, but as a good politician would always say, I, you never say you never, You never right? say never. I mean, so there's no plans on your desk no. is what you're, you're no, saying? No, I'm, I'm so excited and committed uh, with the work I'm doing with San Francisco AIDS Foundation right now. We are on the cusp of, be, cusp of being able to move toward that day when a new HIV infection in San Francisco is incredibly rare and to work with a talented staff and board and people in this community to move us closer to that day. Mm -hmm. And as if you, when you read the book, in honor of some very dear friends of mine who I lost to HIV, mm -hmm. that's pretty compelling and powerful work for me right now. Are we gonna have a cure? I don't know if we'll have a cure right away. You know, there's cure. Oh, right away, but I mean, you think we might have a cure. Oh, I think someday a cure will come and I think a vaccination may come, but before a cure and before vaccination, today we can end HIV transmission. Right. through people being in treatment, through people practicing the practices that we know will prevent them from, from acquiring the virus. So uh, before cure and vaccine, we can stop HIV today. You know, there was a time when it seemed like, especially in the South, I'm from Virginia, that uh, in the late 60s, a lot of Democrats were bec becoming Republicans. Mm -hmm. And lately, it seems like there are a lot of Republicans becoming Democrats. Yeah. Last question, and it's kind of philosophical. You know, we just finished the latest debacle of yes. trying to get a budget. and. Uh, it seems like the GOP brand took more of a licking than the, the Democrats did. Mm -hmm. But as my grandmother used to say, if you put a Democrat and a Republican in a bag and shook them up, I don't know who would fall out first. Mm -hmm. What can these parties teach each other? Last question. What can the Democrats teach Republicans? And what can Republicans teach Democrats? And in general, but specifically about LGBT issues. Uh, about LGBT issues, they simply need to accept the fact that sexual orientation is not a choice. That's sort of the foundation. When you can move to where sexual orientation is no longer a choice, because it's not, uh, then you can move toward, well, then why aren't people being treated equally? And mm -hmm. look at the people in your lives, whether it's your work life, your neighborhood, your church, your own family, families of friends. There are LGBT people involved and, and active and, and visible now more than ever. And that visibility then combined with our straight allies standing up for us has what has moved us closer to full equality. So they can both teach each other by listening to each other, being thoughtful, and just being available to accept that full equality is really both morally right and just. Great. Thanks so much for being on the show. We've My been pleasure. speaking with Neil Giuliano. 
CEO of the San Francisco AIDS Foundation and author of the new book, The Campaign Within. Next up, our conversation with Jules Plumador about his work at the Mental Health Association of San Francisco, specifically a program helping the transgender community. We'll be right back.